We do have a good, good Heavenly Father. and What a blessing it is. Grab your Bible, open up to Romans chapter 1. And we're going to start a new series today, a very short one, but a new series about who is your one. Well, I guess you've probably noticed that our country is in a mess. I mean, we don't need to elaborate on that, do we? Go around the country and see the mass shootings. We can look in the political world when they don't only disagree, they hate each other. They can't work together. Uh, the uh, families breaking up, drug epidemics, suicide. I mean, we just go on and on and on. So we've got a horrible problem in our country. The question is, what do we do about it? Well, you and I as Christians know the answer, and here's the answer. When we bring people to Christ, I mean, when they truly know him, not when they just have some religion or show up for church once in a while. When people really come to Christ and they know him, their lives will be changed. That is the answer. No person who's thinking about going out and shooting a bunch of people, that person doesn't know Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. They don't know him. So we need to get people to know Jesus Christ. That's a big part of our church. Our church is about, and we've looked at it for the past several weeks, it's about glorifying God. It is about growing believers because we do not want you to be born again and then stay a spiritual infant. We don't want that to happen. Glorifying God, growing believers, and reaching people because people are made in the image of God and Jesus died for people and therefore we want to reach people, not just so it will help our country, but so that that person will have a real relationship with Jesus Christ. That is what our church should be all about. And ours is not the only one. Uh, many, many evangelical churches want to do that very same thing. We want to reach people. And the sister churches in our convention, the Southern Baptist Convention, the sister churches are about that too. And so much so that this year we're pushing something called Who's Your One? And what that's about is this, that, that we are trying to get every person to make relationships with at least one person who needs to know Jesus. And we pray for that person and we minister for that person and we care about that person and after we built a bridge, we go across that bridge with the gospel and we invite them to Jesus Christ. Who's your one? And we want every person to do that. Listen, if every person did that, think about how our country could be changed. Uh, let me just give you some numbers. In our world today, <clears throat> 2.4 billion people claim to be Christians. All right, 2.4 billion if all of those 2.4 billion made a relationship with one other person and in that year brought them to Jesus Christ, my math is not very good, okay, but that will be 4.8 billion. In less than one more year, if all those people went out and brought somebody else, the, the whole world would know Christ, see, in just less than two years. Now, here's what's wrong with that. Number one, there are really not 2.4 billion people who are Christians in this world. All of us know people who say they're Christians, and they're really not. And God is the judge of that, but it's obvious there's not 2.4 billion. Okay? Second problem is this. A whole lot of people don't want to come to Christ. I mean, there's a whole lot of people, for example, uh, radical Islamists. They would rather kill you than come to Christ. Okay? So they don't want to. And we have people in our own country, uh, uh, secularist, uh, rabid atheist. They do not want to come to Jesus Christ. So there's a the second problem. But here's the third problem. For those who really are Christians, for those who really are, a lot of us don't really care that other people don't know Jesus and don't really want to go about it, bringing them to Jesus and really don't know how. So we're going to talk about that this morning and next Sunday and maybe the Sunday after that. And I want every person in our church family to move to the place where we have at least one person 
that we're loving, ministering to, praying for them, helping them, and seeking to bring them to Jesus Christ. Now, how do we do that? Say, Pastor, I've tried to do that before. I get tongue-tied. I don't know what I'm doing. I get off. I fumble. How do I do that? We're going to see one verse this morning, just one verse. And that will help you reach people for Jesus Christ. It's Romans 1.16. Now, the gospel or, or the uh, book of Romans is all about the road to righteousness. Some people call it the Roman road. And it's about how we can have righteousness through Jesus Christ so that we can come into the presence of God, his Father. But this one verse in Romans, verse 16, tells us a lot of things that we need to know and we need to put into practice so we can ultimately bring somebody to Jesus. Somebody out there needs him. We work with them. We, they're in our family. They live across the street, and they need Jesus Christ. So what do we do about it? Let's just read this text. Let me read three verses just to give us a little context. Romans 1, 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man or the just man shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We're zeroing in on verse 16. How can I reach somebody for Jesus Christ. This verse helps us. First of all, we see in the very first phrase, it says, if we're going to reach somebody, I cannot be ashamed. Paul wrote, I am not ashamed of the gospel. In the previous verse, verse 15, he said, I am eager to preach the gospel. And part of our problem here in trying to go and share Jesus with people and bring them to him. Part of our problem is that we are embarrassed, not of Jesus so much, but maybe we're embarrassed by our church or maybe we're embarrassed by some of our, our doctrines, you know, that seem to go against the culture. Maybe we're a little embarrassed or maybe we're a little intimidated because that person is smarter than I am and I'm a little intimidated by that or or maybe we're afraid. We're just, we're introverts. And we, the last time we spoke to a person was five years ago. And we're not really, you know, too interested in doing that. And, and so we have all these problems. But Paul writes, if you're going to share it, says, I'm not ashamed. And we've got to come to the place where we are not ashamed. Where we have the boldness that comes from the Spirit, not yourself, but from the Spirit. We know truth because we have studied. God has given us truth. And by the way, for those of you who will say, um, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm sort of afraid to talk to somebody about Jesus because they might ask me a question. I wouldn't know how to answer it. Well, hey, that's true for me too. I mean, somebody can ask me a question. I don't know how to answer. But for some of you, and that is just a really big problem tonight in Sunday Night Seminary, we are beginning a series, and it's called Hard Questions for Christians. Russ already announced it a little bit earlier in the service, and it's about those really tough questions. If God is good, why does he let people go to hell? Is the Bible really true? Questions like that. Did the resurrection, could it really have happened? So we're going to talk about those beginning tonight, and it's going to be pretty much of this fall. So I invite you to that. But the reason I want to do that is so your faith can be strong. You'll not be afraid. You'll not be embarrassed. You'll not be intimidated, because if you are, you can never share with anybody now you say why was Paul not ashamed why was he not afraid because he had had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ on the way to Damascus to persecute Christians Jesus appeared to him in a blinding light it stunned him it knocked him to the ground he was blind for days and he got up from that and he was a changed man because he had a real encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ now I have never had that kind of encounter, and I've never met anybody who has. 
But if you are truly born again and you truly know Jesus, you have had an encounter with him. And that real encounter with him ought to work in your heart to produce some boldness so we can begin to reach people. And so you can have at least one, at least one that you're praying for, loving, ministering to, and trying to bring them to Jesus Christ. If we're going to reach people, we cannot be ashamed. Second, if we're going to reach people, we have to understand we have good news. Notice what he says in verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel. That word in Greek is euangelion. You for means good, like eulogy means a good word about somebody. Angelion, that's where we get our word angel. It means a messenger or somebody who has news. This word in Greek means good news. That's what the gospel is. It's good news. But a lot of us going around like it's bad news. Uh, if you come to Jesus, you know, you got to go to church on Sunday morning, listen to some old boring preacher, you know, go to sleep. At least you'll get a nap. And they might want you to give, you know, and they might expect a little something of you. And I mean, you have to give up everything you like and it'll be really boring. You know, we, we tell it like it's bad news. It's good news. When people really understand what kind of situation they're in, and then they see the gospel. The gospel is Jesus came and died on the cross for our sin. We were sinners. That's the bad news. Jesus came and died on the cross. He rose from the dead to give us new life. It is good news. Because it changes us in so many wonderful ways. Before you came to Christ, listen. If you are a Christian, before you came to Christ, you were guilty in your sin. But the good news is that Jesus brings forgiveness of sin. The Bible says before you came to Christ, you were dead in your sins. Dead in your trespasses and your sins, Ephesians chapter 2. But Jesus through regeneration brings us to life in God. Before we came to Christ... We were far, far from God. But Jesus, through the reconciling process, brings us close, brings us near. Before we knew Christ, we were lost. We didn't know where we were going. We were confused about life. We were just lost. But when we come to Christ, we are found in Him. Before we come to Christ, we were spiritual orphans. We had no spiritual family. But God adopts us into his family, brings us close to him. And now he is our heavenly father. And in Christ, we have brothers and sisters. We have spiritual family. See, all that's what happens in the gospel. Before we came to Christ, Satan was our master. Now Jesus is our Lord. Before the gospel touched us, we were in the kingdom of darkness. Now we've been transferred, the Bible says, to the kingdom of light, the kingdom of his, God's dear son, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. See, it's good news. And it's something to share. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed because I've got incredible good news to tell people. Listen, if today you found some cure, all you got to do is take a pill and you lose weight. And it's perfectly safe. And it's perfectly healthy. Okay. I'll, I'll just take this pill. You'd be telling all your friends, look what we found. Man, if we, had, if we found a pill, all we had to do was take it, and it made our bald spots close up, the hair grew back, the receding hairlines came back. I mean, we'd be out telling all of our bald friends, hey, look what we found. It's good news. And we laugh about that. But we've had, we found something incredible. It's not bad news. It's good news. These people that are shooting, they're shooting because they're mad. Their lives are messed up. They probably didn't have a relationship with their father. They need a relationship with the heavenly father. There is good news. And Paul said, I am not ashamed because I've got good news. Now notice what else he says. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. I can reach people because... I'm not ashamed. The Spirit of God gives me boldness. 
I've got good news to share, and this gospel is powerful. Now, here's a misconception people have about trying to share Jesus with somebody. You think you have to be powerful. You think, well, I've got to be very persuasive in my presentation. Well, I've got to have a powerful testimony about how I was on drugs, and then Jesus re- saved me, and I'm not on drugs anymore. Or, or I have to be so persuasive, so powerful in the way I present it. I have to have all the right words. I have to say it just exactly right. I have to be powerful or they'll not come to Jesus. The truth is, the Bible says, that the power is in the gospel. The power is in God and his gospel. It's not in us. And boy, that takes a a lot of pressure off of you. So you don't have to be eloquent to share the plan of salvation with somebody. You don't have to be powerful in your demeanor and your you don't have to be like that. You just have to be godly and let God do the work. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed. It's it's the gospel, it's good news, and it's the power of God. Our God is powerful. He speaks, and the whole universe popped into existence. You and I can't even make it rain one drop, but God causes a flood to come and covers the whole earth. He is powerful. God parts the Red Sea when the children of Israel need to get to the other side. He parts the Red Sea, and they walk across on dry land. God quenches the power of fire when it's trying to burn Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego up. He shuts the mouths of lions when Daniel is in the lion's den. God is able to take a picnic lunch and break it and multiply it and feed 5,000 men plus women and children. Our God is powerful. But the most incredible kind of power is when God reaches down and changes a person. It's the power of the gospel. And folks, we have seen it here. I can look out over this congregation, and I know people who, he he has touched your life. We had a man who was almost 80, and he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And the last five years of his life were so different. We have a young couple. They'll be here in the next service. This young couple, they they were this close to divorce. And they cried out to Jesus, and they received Jesus as Savior and Lord, and it turned their lives around, and they've got a happy family now. They're ministering in our church. We have things going on in college. We have these kids, and they're partiers, and they're drunkards, and immoral, and all kinds of stuff. And they meet Jesus Christ, and their life's turned around. That is the power of the gospel. And that's why we want to share that with people, so their life can be turned around too. If we're going to reach people, we cannot be ashamed. We've got good news to share. And it is powerful. God can work. And here's something else that's good about it. It's for everyone. Now look back at the text. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. To the Jewish people, there are only one, two kinds of people in the world, Jews and non-Jews. Okay, Jews and Gentiles. Well, he said both can come to salvation. In the Old Testament, the emphasis has been on the Jews. In the New Testament, it opens up to the whole world. And God hangs out the welcome sign to the whole world, and the gospel is for everyone who will believe. It's for everyone. God's gospel is not exclusive. It is inclusive. If you go to the Texas Tech football game, and you decide that you're going to go up to some of these suites... And you start going up there, and they're going to stop you, and they're going to say, excuse me, uh, and you can't go here. It's exclusive. If you want to go down and sit on the 50-yard line in somebody else's seats, and you might head down in that direction, and you may sit down, and somebody's going to come along and say, "Uh, excuse me, what what are you doing in my seat? Say, you're excluded. You're not welcome there. There's certain restaurants. If you don't have a coat and tie. And a lot of money in your back pocket. You can't go there. See, Some places are exclusive. But the gospel is inclusive. Folks, listen. Jesus says, rich, poor, middle class. Come on. Jesus says, red and yellow, black and white. 
come up. Got four PhDs or never finished sixth grade? Come on. Come on. Male, female, confused? No. Jesus said, I'll help you figure that out. I really will. Come on. The worst of the worst or the worst of the self-righteous Pharisees can come because Jesus invites us to come. And folks, if you're out there thinking, oh, I've got somebody that I work with and man, their life's a mess and I don't know whether Jesus would take them or not. Yes, he will. They got to come on his terms, but yes, he will. Somebody in your family and they're the black sheep of the family and nobody in your family likes them. You know what? Jesus loves them and he wants them to come. And Jesus says, for everyone. Paul says, I can share this gospel. I can go into a crowd. I can stand up and preach to this crowd and say, whosoever will may come. The invitation is open. Jesus says, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. The way is open. Please come. It's for everybody. Isn't it wonderful to have something you can share with everybody? That's what's so good about our gospel. It's for everyone. And then one more thing. We can share this because all people have to do to come is believe. Now notice. It's the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. John 1, 12 says, As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe on His name. John three sixteen. God so loved the world, gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. People have to believe. People might come here and say, you know, I want to come to Jesus. I have been a horrible person. I've done all kinds of, everything that's wrong, I've done it. And I want to come to Jesus. So what have I got to do? Have I got to walk across Hot coals barefoot? No. Do you have to crawl across broken glass? No. Do I have to beat myself up in repentance? No. What do I have to do? Believe. Well, Pastor, I know, I know probably what I have to do is I have to come and I have to get baptized and I have to take communion and I have to give a lot of money to the church and I have to, um, I have to go by the golden rule and be nice to everybody. And I've got to be at church every time the doors are open. I've got to do all that to get in. No. Listen, you come to Christ, you come in, you're going to do some of those things. We're going to baptize a young man in the second service. You're going to do some of those things. But that's not how you get in. You believe. You believe. Now, that belief is not just an intellectual assent. All right, go back to verse 17. It says, we believe in verse 16. And then verse 17 says, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. You can't see it in the English, but the word believe and faith are almost identical words. Believe is pistuo, and faith is pistis. They both have the same root word. So the idea is, belief means to have faith. If I believe, I have faith. If I believe, I, I am a person of faith. So it's not just something that one time I said, well, yeah, I believe there is a Jesus. That's not real faith. It's I'm coming to him as Savior and Lord, and I believe he can save me. I'm trusting everything about me to him. And when we believe, he changes our life. See, it is a life changing belief, not just something that flitters across our mind and we say, well, yeah, but it's a life changing belief. It changes us. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. So it's such an incredible belief. It transforms your life. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are preaching in Philippi and they get in trouble as they almost always did because people then and people now are hostile to the gospel. They got beat up. 
thrown in jail. The jailer took them. He was probably laughing. He thought it was funny these guys got beat up. He took them down to the deepest, darkest, nastiest part of the prison and put their feet in stocks. It was an uncomfortable thing. He's kind of laughing as he goes back up to his living quarters and sits down to a meal with his family, and then they all go to bed. But Paul and Silas at midnight are singing down in the nasty dungeon, and God sends an earthquake. And the earthquake not only shakes the jail, but it shakes the jailer. And you know the story. And he comes running down. He sees the prisoners having all escaped. He's just about to commit suicide, but he sees the prisoners hadn't escaped. And then he falls down at Paul and Silas' feet and says, What must I do to be saved? That tells me they had already been talking to him about it. But now he's interested. See, when you first begin to talk to somebody, they may not be interested, but they may be later. He falls at their feet. What must I do to be saved? And Paul doesn't say, walk across hot coals. He doesn't say, crawl across broken glass. He doesn't say, go to church every year solid for a, a, a year. And if you do that, then you can. That's not what he said. What does he say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And he did. And it changed him. And so that crusty old jailer takes Paul and Silas, and he washes their wounds, and he brings them up into his house, and he sets food before them, and he gets baptized, and he is a changed man instantaneously by the power of God. And folks, listen, you can see that happen too. There's somebody you work with, somebody in your family, somebody you go to school with, whatever, and they're like that old jailer. They're just crusty. They're hard. They're mean. And you think, man, probably their mama doesn't even love them. <laughs> but by the power of God, you begin to love them. And you begin to pray for them. And you're extra nice to them. And you build a relationship with them. And one day, the timing is right, and you tell them about Jesus Christ. And if the Holy Spirit has been working in their heart, and if they believe, they can be transformed. And you can see a miracle. Wouldn't that be incredible? So I'm asking everybody in this church family that you find one person. You write their name down somewhere. You begin to pray for them. You begin to ask God to work in their life. And you see the power of God through the good news transform them. And if that happens enough, that will change a nation and a world. Would you bow your heads, please, this morning? This is what I want you to do. As you bow your heads this morning, I want to ask yourself, I want you to ask yourself two questions. Number one, because we have a lot of people in our church that are new in this past year, and I don't know everybody personally, and I don't know you, but it's my responsibility as a pastor to make sure that you have had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not enough just to show up for church meetings on Sunday. Have you had a real encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ that changed your life? I mean, there, there was that point where you didn't know him, and then you did. You began to be different. Have you had that encounter? You can't share it with somebody else if you don't have it. Have you ever come to that place where you said, yes, I do believe. He's changed my mind. He's changed my heart. He's changed my life. I do believe. Now, if you haven't, right where you sit, you don't have to say anything out loud. He reads your mind. He reads your heart. You could call out to Jesus. He says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He sees your heart. He knows if there's faith and belief there. He sees it. And you can be a different person. He invites you. He cares about you. You're not excluded. He wants you to receive him. Jesus died for you.
second question for a whole lot of us. It is this. Who, who's your one? Now, I hope you have ten, but at least you ought to have one. One person that you want to see go to heaven with you. One person that their life's a mess and a wreck and you want to love them, pray for them, minister to them, and tell them. Who's your one? The world could be changed if more and more people came to Christ and got transformed. The world could be changed. But it starts one at a time. So who's your one? Will you ask God, if you don't have one, would you ask God to show you who your one would be? God is big. God is powerful. He's smart. He can show you instantly who that person needs to be. Who's your one? And ask God to help you. Lord, I'm a little embarrassed. I'm intimidated. I'm an introvert. Help me. Lord, help me to see that it's good news. That I don't have to be powerful. You are powerful. Ask God. Our Father, every word you say to us in the scripture is true. Romans 1.16 is true. We have something so good to share. Help us not to be embarrassed or ashamed. Help us to move forward in your power. The power's not in us. Lord, help us to be thankful that everybody's included. Even we were included. Thank you for that. And Lord God, help us to believe. Help those out there who are unbelievers to come to the place of belief and to be transformed. We ask you for all of this. In Jesus' name.